Hey watercolor wizards, Hajra here. Today we'll be doing a Art Nouveau painting in watercolor and it's of an original piece that I've been working on and let me just go make sure that my Art Nouveau stream is off because I don't want there to be an echo. Okay, so let's close that. All right, cool. All right birthday right was it I think was it the 200th this year right so I did like this tribute piece and if you could open the data viz that she did so she did a data visualization and um, you might know about Florence Nightingale at least heard the name if not know about her but she did apart from a huge amount of work as a nurse and a, a pioneer for for women um, as far as women being shown as being smart and capable during her time she also made a, she was also a pioneer of data viz and she did this diagram of the causes of mortality in the army in the east um, and this is during the Crimean War to be specific and it's uh, one of the first data visualizations which is a um, a visual chart that shows information so it's basically in the name um, so in this case I had taken a part of that chart right here and it's this part right here and from you know this is basically showing the deaths uh, I think it's disease versus disease versus wounds in battle versus, right um I can't remember what the third one is. Yeah, there is a third category, and at this point it says you can read it right here. From preventable or mitigatable zoonotic diseases, the red wedge measured from the deaths of wounds, and the black wedge measures the center of deaths from all the other causes. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, so that's what it's showing, and um, and that's what I did is I made it into a design and perched a nightingale on top as a tribute piece to her, um, you know, because she's Florence Nightingale, so a nightingale. And this diagram is called Nightingale's Rose because it's now a famous uh, data visualization. So I went ahead and added some art deco sort of type roses into that and that was what resulted in this piece earlier this year. I did another original um, painting. This wasn't an art deco style. This one is in an art nouveau style. In this case I used a an ink portrait that I saw of her online. Um, I don't think it's that easy to, um, I guess you could find it if you go look for Florence Nightingale, but it's basically a very heavily rendered in that age sort of like, you know, semi Victorian style portrait and I also put um, the medal that she received from the Queen in her hair Which is uh, something that I found in Wikipedia I took another part of her diagram this time the other side and I put her inside of it and, and Again, it's called Nightingale's Rose. I put roses in it So the reason I thought this would be a good demo for the promo for the class that I have for the Santa Cruz Art League coming up this weekend is because I'm using a limited palette just like would be using a limited palette in the Zorn palette. Okay, so We'll be doing this this weekend. This is uh, the famous Zorn palette made famous by Swedish master painter Anders Zorn. Oh, before I continue, I'd like to thank Elijah here uh, for being a moderator and also um, Heather, who is my excellent moderator in the comments as well. So if you have any questions, um, those two can also answer them for you. And um, otherwise, everybody else here, welcome for from whether you're coming from the Santa Cruz Art League's audience or my online audience from Instagram, YouTube, or former patrons. Thanks to everybody um, for watching. I hope you find this fun and informative. Um, as you know, I tend to put in a lot of information into my stuff. So there, as you can see, there's already history in the art that I've created there. And we're working on some more um, history just with the palettes actually, right? Because this is a historical palette. So this palette consists of just yellow ochre, vermilion, and black standing in for the blue. And you can see that brings down this entire section of the wheel. So you end up having these low chroma greens and also low chroma violets, you know, and, and uh, air quotes because it's a type of green or it's a type of violet, very low chroma, which means that the saturation is much lower because there is no proper blue. Now, of course he did use blue and by he, I mean Ander Zorn, but he is famous for using a limited palette that was very effective for portraits that did consist of these colors often. So um, that's why we're going to be working on it. Um, it's because it's a great uh, starters limited palette for portraits. So here is the um, uh, sketch that I have for that for download. And I'll be needing to transfer my sketch onto here. I've already done this painting in the past. So here's the painting right here, but this is not using the Zorn palette. That's why you have all these really vibrant purples and blues in this piece. So we're gonna actually lose um, all of those and it'll look like a completely you know, different mood as a result of it being in these colors instead. So that's what we're gonna be working on this weekend. So if you're interested in learning how to do the tiling technique with gouache, learning how to paint a portrait, and also working in a limited palette, you know, I've done lots of color theory classes for the Santa Cruz Art League so far. And this is, um, you know, I'm trying to do classes now that combine 
the color theory as well as either gouache or watercolor, whether it's watercolor and grisaille or tiling and gouache. That way you sort of get to double dip. And in fact, we get to sort of triple dip by having um, the, we get, we get to have a, um, you know, on top of that, the color theory. So that's what we're gonna be doing this weekend. So hopefully you'll join me for that, but let's start painting a little bit of what we've got here. There's only a few more days left to sign up for that. That's gonna be this Saturday. And I did end up rescheduling another class solo on my own for that ink class. We'll talk about that at the end. But, um, you know, if you want to take the, uh, the the drawing class that I have, Five Ways to Draw Anything, we're going to be doing Tenniel Studies from Alice in Wonderland, a Gibson girl um, in the Charles Dana Gibson style, and also be doing a Rene Bull Fantasy Castle. And so I've rescheduled that as well. You can see the links for that. Um, it just felt like since I did all the prep for that, I might as well, you know, be doing that class. So I'm going to get that over with before I have other obligations for, um, projects that I have to work on. Um, so, and what I mean by that is I'm not going to be teaching as many classes for the next month or two, uh, at least with the art league. I might do a few solo classes because they're easier for me to sort of randomly and spontaneously plan. But, um, that's because I had, like I said, some other projects that I have coming up. But I do hope that you take advantage of the, the few that I will be doing with the art league. All right, so I've got my brushes here. So this is the uh, um, the limited palette that I had for the Nightingale, which is right here. And you can sort of compare how this mood is different than say a very fully saturated red, yellow, and you know, a primary red, primary yellow, primary blue mood. And so we're gonna be doing, um, you know, this, uh, this type of uh, color scheme for the piece today, except for it's gonna be even more limited in that there is really no blue and it stops so that there is no this part of the wheel, okay? So basically I did choose a nice bright red, which is the Windsor Red Deep, because I happen to have a watercolor stick in that color and I wanted to try it. I took a yellow ochre, which is very similar to the Zorn palette. So these two colors are very similar to the Zorn palette that we're working on this weekend. But instead of having a black stand in for the blue, I stopped with a serpentine genuine, because again, I wanted to try this color. I've had it for a while and haven't used it. So I thought it's a nice Daniel Smith color. I might as well give it a whirl again in a watercolor stick. So here it is mirrored on my, um, my wheel, on my palette. And I've always said, try to mir mirror your palette to your color wheel when you can. It really helps painting for limited palettes. Um, you know, for limited palette and uh, the colors that you get, it's very interesting to see them. And then you might get confused if you have them mixed everywhere <laughs> on your palette, if it's like just randomly. But if you mix it in the direction of the wheel, it tends to keep it pretty clear, you know? Mm -hmm. So on this limited palette, because the palette consists of two primaries and a secondary, I've noticed that when you've mixed it on the actual color wheel, mm -hmm. you've only mixed a single block in between the primary yellow and the secondary green. Is that something you recommend or do people, or sometimes do people want to spread that out? Well, this only has this many sections, but what I did was I added slightly more green for this one and slightly more yellow for that side. So you can definitely make the little spectrum of the intermixes in between. It doesn't just have to be one color. But yeah, I got the general idea with the major colors, but depending on how I've drawn my wheel, I can do a little gradient there. Um, it's the same thing for the for the red and green mixing together, which is going to be my only real shadow color going across the wheel. In this case, because I had space down here and there was no tertiary, um, no uh, third color in the triad, I just go, went ahead and mixed this primary and the secondary together to get it here. Otherwise, I would usually mix across the wheel, um, which is what I did over here. So over here, I've got the red and the green, and again, more green on this side and more red on this side will give me a variety of sort of these brownish colors. So now I kind of know the range of the colors I can operate with. Again, it's nice to have that almost as a color, you know, map, a color key before you get started so you know um, what colors you're going to be having um, in your piece. Okay, so I'm going to put this away and again I want to draw that comparison um, to a few of the other pieces we've been doing this year because it seems like this is a big year for me, be, for me to be doing low chroma old masters triads and I always said I wanted to do more of those. I just didn't realize I was going to do them all in one year. <laughs> so. So that is going to uh, be interesting. So let's start painting this. Um, I've already gone ahead and inked this with a waterproof marker. This is an Arches cold uh, pressed paper on the back side. And I used it, um, I used I used a <laughs> kneaded eraser. It's because I was thinking kneaded and so use it. But anyway, um, I used a kneaded eraser to get rid of most of the pencil lines. It's a lot easier on the paper than even a white eraser, depending on, you know, um, how kind you want to be to your paper. All right, so this is a waterproof zig marker. You can also use a waterproof micron. 
You can also use a brush to ink it. I did use a brush for some of these areas for the more delicate lines. I prefer that, but I try to use markers when I'm teaching because it's easier for students to follow along. Um, you know, brush inking is a little bit more difficult. So what I'm going to... Do you have any questions so far? No questions. Just people saying hello, like Dora, Evett, and Heather telling you that she sent you an email and things like that. So. Okay, great. I didn't get a chance to check my emails before I got on here, but thanks so much for uh, to Heather for being here to help moderate. And I'm going to go ahead and drop some water into my palette here. I'm just going to use a few drops. It looks like the Windsor and Newton watercolor sticks, which were the yellow ochre and the red, really sort of melted into a puddle versus looks like the uh, Daniel Smith one is rather waxy and lumpy. Now it, um, I don't know if that means, you know, one will work better th than the other. I've only ever used the Soda Light Genuine for the Zorn Widow portrait, which is again another video on YouTube that you can watch for free for um, the the Daniel water Daniel Smith watercolor sticks. So you can go ahead and check that out if you want as well. It was a pretty good color when I used it that time. And they seem to have flowed pretty well, all of them, when I was working on um, the color wheel, but that's all I've used them for so far. Just gonna give that there and a, a few drops of water in the middle there. Um, usually that's where I mix my neutrals, but since I've got all that around, I might as well put a little bit of water there. Okay, so I'm gonna move this um, to some place where I can actually move around. And I think where we're gonna start is, I would say the face, but I think we should start on something a little bit uh, more exciting, like maybe the, the flowers or such. So let's start a little bit on that. So I think the whole idea of fitting this into an Art Nouveau piece style, you know, it's like, it was a lot of fun to, to do that diagram and then put the roses into it. Um, again, it always takes me a little bit of going to decide where I'm starting and then once we get started we can sort of, you know, plug along. It gets faster as soon as you get started. So I'm going to go ahead and wet this entire flower. I'm not even really sure if that's what I want. But if it's not, that's not such a big deal because I'm not like soaking it, so it'll dry off pretty fast, especially under these lights. There's more lights uh, on the desk than there are on me. We're sort of falling off into shadow away from the desk. And that's because otherwise it would get rather hot here. Okay, so, um, and so what I want to do is I think I like this just to be a nice peachy color for these roses and some of it to be yellow. So I'm going to stay away from the green unless I'm doing the stems. And even the stems, I might head more towards yellow. I'm going for more of those Nouveau type colors that you kind of see. So let's tilt this a little bit. Put this over here. If you ever move your palette across the paper, then just make sure that your, your palette's not tracking paint. If it's not tracking paint, then you know you can move it around, especially if it's a small palette. But I have had people who've moved it around and then been really sorry afterward because they weren't careful about checking to see if there's paint underneath it. There's always things you can do, of course, to correct, but, you know, not really the best idea to do that. Okay, so what kind of comments do you have there? Someone was asking where the classes will be held and how long they'll have access to it, so I was telling them that they'll be held through. YouTube and they'll have permanent access to it. Yeah, and you can say that out loud too in case somebody doesn't read it. Which is that, yeah, we I usually have rewatch videos up, um, so they're live live streams off of YouTube. Oh, look at what a pretty, pretty sort of dusky, you know, sort of drying out rose color that is. This is one of the reasons why I like the neutral colors is that you get these really pretty colors that aren't, this is wet on wet, so I'm getting the soft edges. So again, when we're doing this weekend, I'd explain every step and not be distracted by answering questions about classes and stuff like that. But it's just a nice, peaceful way to spend your time is to paint a little, a few flowers every now and again. Because honestly, with those soft blends, you can't really go wrong with watercolor and botanicals. Try to fit those into my pieces as much as I possibly can. This is like a nice brownish, pinkish red. It's almost like a potter's pink type color, and you can buy that color. But this is a nice color to have. Um, I'm gonna wait for that to dry and come back with a wash of red over the top for that to make it a little bit more. In fact, let me do a neutral color down the side here. But I think these sort of like more serious roses is what I'd like to do for this because you know it's not uh, it's not gonna be uh, an upbeat piece, right? So if I'd used a, it's a very serious piece. It's about a date of his that had to do with war. And also on top of that, it's, uh, you know, a piece that's a tribute to um, somebody who was a serious person. So, you know, you have to choose your colors according to your to your mood, too, right, for your, for your actual piece. And not just go in any which direction as far as mood and interest. 
but it gives you some really nice um, roses. Let me get a little bit closer. That way we can have people see that even closer. Because if I'm working on a piece that's a little bit zoomed in, that's a nice thing about having this mount that I can sort of scoot around. Yeah, I always have a rewatch video and you have access to that pretty much forever as long as you're the first 50 signups. There's only 50 signups total that are allowed based off of the platform that we use. So if you're not one of the first 50 people who sign up, then you don't get to take the class even afterward. You can, you know, there's only 50 seats available for all time. But if you are one of those 50, then you get that video for all time as well. So you have to sign up with a YouTube or a Gmail or a Google account though, because I am using YouTube live streams. So you can watch the stream with any account. You don't even have to have a YouTube account if you wanna just watch it. But if you wanna rewatch the recorded video forever and ever, then you're gonna to have to have a Gmail um, or a Google or YouTube account. All right, so that's that. I think Heather I... asked, what, the me... what does the medal say? Um, I think it says, blessed are the merciful. And it's, um, if you look it up on Wikipedia, you can look up the name of the medal. If you look up Florence Nightingale and stuff, you can look it up on there. And maybe you can look it up in a little bit so you can explain to people. I'm going to go right into this part with the darker color because I can see that that heart area of a rose might be warmer. Again, you know, just look up. Is there anything that determines where you start in a piece, in a rose like that, the darker or the lighter, or is it just personal preference? Um, no, I mean, I just, I, I just basically go based off of, like, you know, if I'm streaming here, I can just start wherever I want. I think if you are starting, um, you know, and you're thinking about it a little bit more decidedly, I would start on an area of really dark value and really light value, so that way you can get an anchor point for both of those things pretty much immediately when you start. And once you have that anchor point, then you can sort of proceed um, from there with much more confidence because then you know what your darkest and lightest values are and they will help anchor your decisions after that. You see what I'm saying? But you're not going to have that happen unless you make that effort to, um, you know, put the darkest spots in, at least one darkest spot, you know. So this rose is quite dark in that heart area. And I can see from my um, color scheme here that probably one of the lightest, uh, the darkest I can go is either the darkest pure red or one of these browns or that green. Obviously this entire area of oranges and yellows and yellow greens is lighter. So that's a nice dark area for me to punch in. And it's always nice to do a Nouveau piece because it's also easy for people who are beginning and it's also satisfying to people who are advanced. And I say that because the ink sort of holds everything together. So anytime we've done like an Art Nouveau piece, it's a great intermediate and sometimes even beginner's way to sort of paint because you end up having, you know, like again, that satisfaction of the ink holding your piece together and your watercolor can be a little bit looser. You know, you can sort of let the watercolor do its own little thing with the, if you've got the ink and wash situation. So I'm going to tilt that a little bit. But it starts to give that great mood already. You know, I haven't done very much yet, but already I have a lot of mood. And just putting in those few colors and trying to figure out, I don't want to do fully saturated colors around here. I want to do these sort of faded, you know, vintagey type colors. And so I'm doing like lighter glazes, but also getting a little bit of the dirtier mix in between this red and the yellow and sort of really watering it down. And it gives for these really nice vintagey sort of effects here. And the one that we're going to be doing this weekend is going to be uh, more opaque because we're going to be, you know, doing something that's... Uh, gouache so you can definitely use gouache like watercolor but I think it definitely shines better as an opaque medium and watercolor watercolor looks its best used uh, transparent while gouache looks its best used opaque and that's how I always use them but you don't have to you can you know use make a set go work both ways okay I'm gonna put a little bit more of that red down the center there but that's kind of what I'm doing with these roses here and again I like this area right here and I want to have a little bit more of a yellow bloom in this area so I might just do one rose to completion and then after that go ahead and continue with the face and the hair so that you get a little bit of a an idea of the different stuff that we're going to be working on and just wanted this to be a bit more saturated with the red and the yellow and I've left some areas here that are very white, and I like the light area there. I don't want to completely eat it up, but I do also want to make come back and make it darker, so I might consider that. Now, with a lot of this stuff, it's going to be made-up lighting 
to some degree, right? Because you're going to have roses that you can look at that are either illustrated or in a photo, but you're going to have to make up the lighting because sometimes you're just not going to get the angle of whatever it is that you drew. So you're going to have to sort of, and you have made up roses, you have to have made up lighting and it just sort of is dictated a little bit by other stuff that you might see, but you know, it doesn't have to be too exact. There, you know, you draw enough flowers, you can end up with flowers that end up looking pretty much okay for a fast, quick Nouveau type flower. Okay, so I'm gonna let this dry and let it settle for a little bit. I want to get those two petals a bit darker, but you know, if I worked this into the entire background and all around it, you can see that it would make a nice sort of like um, almost sort of dried rose, you know, dried rose hips type of mood. You know, that's what I'm looking for is, you know, the kind of dried flowers you see in sort of like potpourri, even though I hate potpourri, kind of, but you know, the kind of dried flowers that you get when you have nice dried um, petals and stuff flying around. Okay, all right, so I've got that up there. And did you ever, could you go look up that metal? I want to talk a little bit more about that metal. So I did throw it into her hair because, you know, it's not something she would do, of course. She was a a very practical lady and good for her, but um, it's a nice way to sort of um, embellish her hair in an Art Nouveau style, so that's why I threw it in there. And the only image of it online is, um, it's not that one, it's on her own page, so if you go to Florence Nightingale on Wikipedia, you can post a link there for people if you want. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make up the lighting on it, so I might go back and tweak it too to make it a bit more metallic. And by that I mean I'm going to, you know, give it a base color of yellow, but then I'm going to give it sort of stronger highlights in some places. So, let's see if I can do that. The best way to work with metal is uh, to have severe, sharp highlights and very sort of non-blending, um, you know, not very strong, not very soft blends, very hard blends. So I'm going to just let it fade off at the top there and then fade off at the bottom. Then I'm going to come back in and sort of see what it tells me to do as far as highlights and shadows, but I'm going to let it be that strong yellow in the center and that strong yellow at the bottom and then fade towards a highlight in two places, the kind of sheen that I kind of feel like you'd see on a coin, right? So you don't have any, you know, um, ideas about how to do something like this and just put a coin on your table and get some ideas about how you might pull the reflection off of that but leaving a few areas of bright highlight and then I'm going to come back and make some of these areas darker with the green because as you might remember from that Pikachu painting that I painted last year or was it the year before? I think it might have been the year before, was it last year? Um, you end up having a lot of greenish colors and well more so in brass than in gold but my assumption is that this is going to be a is it a bronze metal or a, a bronze? I can't, I think it might be made out of well I guess it could have some gold in it to be, to be completely honest so my little brush here is, oh see this is very soft too, so all of these colors are, re are resaturating very easily, so that means those watercolor sticks to me actually are softer to re-wet than uh, the, the Daniel Smith paints when they dry out of a tube, so I've always had uh, issues with them for that reason, so actually if you want to get some paints that, you know, wet down easier than that, you can use the, the watercolor sticks. Alright, so I'm going to probably again move on to the bigger parts of her face so you can see more of it being done. And But at this point I want to throw in a little bit of that green while it's still wet because remember what I said about metal and green. So you do have a little bit of, of that green emphasis. And again, I'm just sort of making this up here and I might come back in here and tweak it. And, you know, I have to look at it and see what parts of it I like and look right to me and the other parts that don't look right to me. Oh, is that what it says? Oh, okay, so blessed are the merciful. So I already wrote that, but I can see that it's colored completely differently. It looks like it's got a blue Crimean flag, uh, blue like a little banner down there. Could you screen capture that or on your phone right here? Just take a photo of it and uh, I'll show it on here because I want to be able to look at that. Now, I have no intention of using those garish colors. Uh, I'm just going to, I mean, pardon to the person who designed that metal, but that's too many colors for her hair. Um, I don't even have a blue in this palette, so I'd have to make do anyway. But it looks like there is definitely a lot of green and yellow going on in that side part of it, so which is good. So, as a, But I am going to be limited to the colors. You can take a picture of that with your phone so I can share it with people. At least I got the yellow and green part, right? And the red. It looks like they colored the flag in the middle with like enamel, it seems like. Um, 
Again, he's going to take a photo and I'll be able to show it to you. But there's an enamel, uh, that little banner down here that says Creamia uh, is all colored blue. So I to try to figure out. And I think I had actually also tucked in the metal behind um, her hair. So this is all hair the way that I painted it. I don't want it to have too much. So here it is. I assumed it was going to be all gold because I got it off of a pencil drawing that was on um, Wikipedia. But in this case, uh, hold on, it is yellow and green. It's got like little stones and the stars up there. And this is the, the cross is red. That's actually good because I can use these three colors, the yellow, green, and the red because those are the three colors that I'm using. I might make um, this, this part that's in the border um, a little bit more darker green but clearly the, the the ship has sailed on keeping those four areas white although I can pick some color out of it and down here there's a a blue and a yellow um, I think I'll make that red because I don't see how else I could make that I could also make it green because um, she's gonna have brownish hair so it depends on which emphasis we put it on but that's nice to actually have that photo um, if you can email me that photo I'd appreciate it because I'm probably going to or just have it open because I'm probably going to use it um, but yeah, so that's good to have that. My assumption was, because I only saw a drawing of it that's completely... And Heather is saying that the center, the VR, stands for Victoria Regia, right? Queen yeah, Victoria. right, yeah, Queen Victoria, yeah. Well, it's, it's nice to... I, it would have been nicer as a brooch, don't you think? But Especially if you could wear it as a fascinator in your hair. But did you email that to me? So I'd like to have that metal open, or you can, you know. Okay, so just let me know. Okay. I'm going to keep it right here then until you can send it to me. Okay, is it already sent? Okay, all right. So let me go ahead and open that then. And just give me a second. I'm going to get that off of my email. Have it open on my computer. I like enamel pieces actually. I just don't like them when they sneak up on me because in this case I was making it all gold. <laughs> now I don't know. I'm torn between making it fully accurate to what do you think? Do you think I should make it fully accurate or just not care? Just not care? Okay. All right, but let me have it open anyway. So just in case I want that. So just give me a second while I open it up. I'm just lifting this painting up so I can have this open. All right, good. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm just trying to... Looks like I'm performing surgery, but um, I was just getting that uh, link open and getting that metal on there. Okay, all right. All right, so I think... And actually, this is cute because I see a lot of sort of dots in the uh, in, in that headpiece right there, in the actual enamel. So actually, that'll be a lot of nice detail for me to work on, and I might actually stipple this in like this to give it that enameled look. Like if you pull that metal up, that's what it's doing, and then use the other brush to stipple in some yellow. So I can make this as detailed as I want, is what I'm saying. So I might stipple in the yellow and then the red and everything. So I might just do a part of this and then again move on to the face where it's bigger. Because you know how, um, if you know anything about me, you know that I like to do stuff realistically in a lot of detail. So if you give me something to work off of that has a lot of really nice detail on it, then you know I'm just gonna go ahead and do that. I mean, I feel like that looks a little bit too much like blood, but, you know. It, it'll be fine once it's all done, but, you know, sometimes colors just look a little bit unsettling, depending on where they're sitting, so it could look like a wound or something, you know, so. But hopefully, once the metal is all colored in all around, and like I said, I think I might add in that other part of it there, too, and then just... But with the yellow stippled in too, you know, that's just a nice uh, technique, because if you go and stipple in the yellow around it, then it starts to read like slightly reflective uh, metal. And I can see that crown there too. And it looks like it's uh, gone dark. My assumption is it must have been a brighter silver, right? Maybe this metal wasn't tarnished and it was more silver back in the day. All right, well, I'll work on that metal in just a little bit, let that part dry off. I think I'll put a, actually come back and put the green in. I like the green in that. Uh... That's the great thing about Nouveau pieces for that reason too is once you get your drawing in, I mean, because this is a nice original drawing, this is not, you know, a master study. I like to do my pieces, at least 50% of them originals and 50% master studies when I teach, because otherwise I don't, I won't get any originals done because I do a lot of teaching with the master studies. So I try to do as many originals as I can when I'm not teaching. But 
putting this in like this. It's just like, you know, once you have the lines and the ink and all the drawing done, that was where all the work was. It took me like two days to do the drawing and the layout and all that other stuff. And it took me, um, you know, a few hours to do the inking. And then once that's all done, then you've got yourself basically a coloring book page to do on this ink and wash style. And what I would do here definitely is come back in with some bright white highlights, you know? If you can give me that Copics, uh, it's just in this drawer right here. No, not the gel pen, the Copics white. It's right in the corner. I don't use gel pens anymore. They're destructive to my work. I am too... Tasha is here. She said yeah. she's happy she didn't miss it all. Oh, yeah. But no, she I... did not miss... Fortunately, she got here in time for you to start talking about gel pens, which... Yeah, no. nobody, nobody misses. Yeah, nobody, nobody misses out on that part of it. But um, here's the the white that I'm poking down. This is just white gouache, and I stopped using the gel pen because um, not only is it not arch archival, so I don't know what its longevity is like, especially for original pieces. That's a difference. But also, I don't like the fact that it's lumpy. Like when you paint with it, it gives like lumps and stuff in the paint when you're painting it with other things. And that's super annoying to me. It's not going to be, you know, a, a good idea to paint lumpy face texture if you've got to highlight someplace. It's happened to me a few times and I was finally like, okay, when am I going to stop using this gel pen? So there I got that VR back a little bit because again, I can see the, I had no idea there was a color version of this metal available. And that just goes to show you that in this case, I didn't do didn't do right by that research, but I probably could have found it if I hadn't been doing this on a stream. But one of the things I'd like to do for this metal, and I do this off the stream again, um, or I'd zoom in with my camera if we were teaching, you know, is get closer to that and stipple in some white too. And again, that's like a texture technique. You go back in and it gives you that sparkly look, you know? I've done it before on lots of pieces. If you know, you go back in and you add that highlight um, at the end there, and it gives you a little bit of that sparkle right on that metal. Hard to see there because it's small, so that's why I'm going to move on to, to the rest of it. But I just wanted to give a good idea of where that metal is going to go. And I'll probably continue to work on it if I, you know, get bored and want to come back to that area. But I wanted to do a little bit of everything. Okay. So, let's do the face now. And the face, um, did you have that um, open for me on the tablet? I mean, on the thingy? Because I want to show everybody what the... Because um, the only thing I really had a reference for, apart from the diagram was the face, and you can look it up, I don't think you have it, or you can take a picture of it, but just look for Florence Nightingale on um, Wikipedia and you'll see it. It's the ink version of it. It's very heavily inked, so I'm, I've changed this into an Art Nouveau style. Yeah, it's that one, but you have to go look for it. And I'm saying, I'm answering that for Elijah. Now, I think a good skin color would be this color in between the ochre and the Windsor Red Deep. Again, that's this side of this wheel is very much like the Zorn palette we'll be using this weekend. So I'm gonna go ahead and wet this whole thing down and given that she was a Victorian lady from England, she is definitely not going to have a sun-kissed California tan, right? So we're not going to give her tan skin. We're also not going to give her um, olive chai-colored skin like mine. We're going to give her very pale skin, so we're going to have to work around that by just making sure our mixes are quite light, right? So I'm going to get this mix right here. And watercolor um, is great because you basically use white from the paper so you don't actually have to work with um yeah so here let me show that real quick so this is the reference i had and you can see i made um you know changes to it by making the hair more ornate and um okay so let me say that again i think diane said it was buffering but you can see that when i did this uh version of it i basically decided to change her hair to look more nouveau out of the metal right and took out some of the darkness in the costume, made it so that she had roses overlapping around her inside of that diagram that's going to be part of that Nightingale's Rose uh, data visualization that she made. So that's what I saw on Wikipedia, and this is my original piece. Now, as a historical figure, I felt like that that's what I should use this, because to be faithful to a likeness of her, if she was, you know, if there was no pictures of her at all, then you could, you know, make it up completely. I mean, you can still do that now, but you'd still have to make her a British lady with brown hair. You know, you couldn't just turn her into, you know, somebody from anywhere because well, she is a you historical You could do figure. what Muha did with Sarah Bernhardt, right? Which well, is... you could romanticize it, yes, but I think that there's um, not as much need to. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and do a pale version, more towards the yellow, actually, add a little bit more yellow. Uh, what I found, and this is information that I don't think anybody ever shared with me, it's just something I have to figure out from trial and error, is your base color should be more yellow, okay? So your base midtone should be more yellow and then after that your colors that you come in with can be more pink but you shouldn't start with 
yellow, I mean, red to begin with, because if you do, it sort of turns into this lobstery type situation once it all starts to fit together. So um, this area here is a bit more red. I want it to be a bit more yellow because that's my base color. And it will, it will go back, you know, it'll sort of dry back, uh, sometimes as much as 30%, but I found not as much as some people will say every color dries a little bit differently, whether it's, you know, oil or oil dries a little bit darker, uh, watercolor dries lighter, and um, gouache dries darker, more matte, and acrylic is more true to the way it dries actually when it comes to the colors more or less because a plastic binder has um, a little bit less influence on it, but it definitely still has um, some color shift as well. So just keep that in mind with your mediums is that you might have to come back in and adjust. And go ahead and put that base color in over her face and her lips as well. I don't really know the color of her costume, but given that this is probably going to be light, I'm going to lift that part of it out of her collar right there while it's still wet. If it doesn't lift, you can sort of scrub at it a bit more. Alright, so now I've got um, a bit more redness over here, and that's alright. It's going to end up fading back, and also on top of that I'm going to add more color even in that area, so it should be fine. I'm actually pretty comfortable with uh, the mistakes that happen, because mistakes will happen, and you just have to know how to work around that, you know? Every once in a while, rarely, you'll end up with a piece where no mistakes happen, but that's not very common. Okay, that's your ear. I tend to miss ears on the first pass, even in classes when I come back and there's always like a white gap where there's an ear. Alright, so this time I actually happen to remember the ear. Alright, so now I'm going to come back in with the shadow, and this time I'm going to make, like I said, the shadow a bit more red. And she's already, I think, for Victorian, quite dark enough, so I'm going to go ahead and not add any more color, and I might even have to lift some depending on how this dries back. I think it should be okay, though. Um, think about Muha's ladies, because, you know, this is an Art Nouveau style, so I'm going for that kind of coloring. But um, in the actual ink piece, she did have shading that went up to here. So I'm using that ink piece as a reference for the shading on this, and then for the face part, where there's not very much shading, we're going to have to improvise. And that's fine. Again, you do enough pieces, then, you know, you can sort of improvise a bit. Now, I did use a little bit of white gel pen, or, you know, I think it was white gel pen over there to lighten up the ink line that was going across her chin. I think, you know, as usual, white gel pen is usually a mistake. <laughs> so, if you ever pull it out and it's for a serious piece, probably just better off putting it back. <laughs> just put it back in the drawer where you got it. Heather wants to know what you would do with the skin if it were more of an olive tone. Well, I'd start with the same yellow mid-tone. In fact, even if it was African skin, I'd start with a similar mid-tone. Um, highlights usually stay the same between races. It's usually just the mid-tone, um, you know, which makes sense because highlights are where the light is reflecting, although you will have different temperature highlights, basically, um, depending on the races. But um, it's usually just your shadow color that changes the most, is what I've noticed. So I'd probably start the same, but I'd make the shadow colors quite a bit darker so that it would make the highlights and then the mid-tone that much more stark when you were, um, you know, doing that. Um, if you get me that jellyfish piece, I can show them um, what that means, so... I'm going to add a little bit more red here. I mean, it, the same goes for made-up skin colors, because what I'm asking him to bring is, uh, it's in that second drawer. And so, I think that qualifies as an olive skin tone. Yeah, no, no, this is purple skin. This is magenta skin, because this is a fantasy piece, and, um, but you can see that's what I did, is the highlights are still white. And um, I ended up doing that, but it's all purples and blues because it's a jellyfish and, and I've been working on it quite a bit So you can see it's slowly coming along. It's quite a bit of jellyfish there. It just keeps going Do you see that it's a very long piece? And so um, it was supposed to be done for you know the end of mermaid But I did not get it done But you can see just the difference between how you would apply gouache and watercolor But also the difference in the highlights is nothing um, It's only the shadow color that really changes and as you blend towards the mid-tone it turns into that But you know like I said this is oh you guys might if you were in my class for the drawing sea creatures uh, class You might recognize this jellyfish. I drew that jellyfish with you guys in um, ink And then after that we sort of did it and uh, you know I, I kept it around and I thought you know, I'd like to make a jelly maid, a mermaid that's half jellyfish, half um, mermaid, and I already had that jellyfish drawn up from that class, so I used it. 
So there you go. That's a nice double dip of uh, that kind of thing. All right, so let's get on to her um, face now. I'm gonna do the interesting part, the most interesting part first. Again, I'm moving, just give me a second. As this gets close to the screen, I'm moving the metal away. I'm actually gonna put it in my thumbnails and then drop it into here so that it goes away. Okay, so now let's see, I've got this for the shading and that, okay, good. All right, so I think I'm gonna do Novo sh shading on this, so not super realistic, very stylized. And that means, uh, think of Muha, just pull up a Muha piece and um, you'll see the kind of shading I'll go for. And the ear is mostly covered, but usually he colors his ear shadow in quite dark in the recess area. And then he comes back in around the border and lets that curve happen and that question mark shape is covered up. That's in the inner part of the ear, so we don't actually have to do that, but I'm just gonna blend towards it. And the other decision I might want to make is how much more warmer or cooler do I want to make her vis-a-vis -vis the roses? And that's not something I really thought of. So it's going to be more spontaneous for this piece. But, you know, if I decided to do another version of this piece, um, you know, luckily I still have the sketch for this. So if I wanted to redo it, I could. So I'm going to go ahead and come in here with this. That's a little bit too red for me for the upper eye, at least for a person of her period. So as a result of that, I'm going to go ahead and mix a bit more have that yellow in and get uh, a, the more yellowish color up there, a more sort of watered down version of that. So the first thing to do is to water that down so that it doesn't look like it's the red of a lip and then after that come back in and add a little bit more yellow to it. Again, this is the first time I've been using these watercolor sticks that I've had sitting around from Winsor & Newton and they're really rewetting quite well. Maybe the, the small amount of waxiness that they had to put in here to make them into watercolor sticks has made them softer and creamier than their paints, but um, I mean, for anybody who has known me for a while, they're not uh, my favorite paints. They don't re-wet very well, but it looks like their watercolor sticks re-wet quite well. If you wanna, you know, uh, choose a paint that re-wets super well, even in a pan or tube form, Sennelier is a good choice, uh, Schmincke is a good choice. They're a bit, not that much, just slightly more expensive than uh, a Windsor or Newton, but not any different than Daniel Smith. Daniel Smith is quite expensive. Yeah, I mean, this is the first time, I mean, I have a few watercolor sticks and I've tried one or two, but I have not tried more of them. And when I went to go pull the colors out for this, the Serpentine Genuine was a watercolor stick. And I thought, okay, I'll use the watercolor stick for the green and then I'll use yellow ochre and my red. And I thought, wait, looks like I have a watercolor stick in those colors, so if it's sitting around, why not just use that? So I just shaved a little bit of it off with an X-Acto knife right into my um, palette. And as a result of that, as it was dry shaved into there and then I dropped the water into it, it's kind of magic. That's my favorite part. I really should have recorded that. <laughs> I might do that again in the future, but I really love taking dry uh, stick shavings, putting them into the palette and then wetting it. And then after that, it sort of just melts together like a cool dream. So very, very fun. Um, I don't know what color her eyes were. We're gonna make them sort of like a brownish hazel, I think is what I'll do. My assumption is, given her photos, that um, she had dark eyes. So I will use the palette I have and give her sort of a, a greenish brownish hazel. And for some reason, that's drawing really goopy. Okay, let's go ahead and, there we go. It's a nice sort of, I think I maintain a little bit more of the color identity by lifting out a bit just around that eye area. And let me rinse my brush off again. And that crease there that I have, um, no shame in throwing in a little bit of that green because that green shadow, with a little bit of it with the red, will give me this brownish color. So if I want some greenish color there, then I could do that. Now it will make it so that there is a bit more low chroma sort of shadow there. So, you know, don't make it too green. If you make somebody's skin too green, they're gonna look like, well, kind of like they're dead. So be careful about that. So I'm gonna come over to this side where I have that brown mixed up, see, with the, the green and the red together. Again, showing on here, right across the page there. Mimic your wheel to your palette and get that brown in, because you know, red and green are complements, as we've learned in some of the other color classes. Gives me a very nice, pleasant brown here. So if I want that for shadow colors, I can definitely do that. And even with a, you know, a, a very pale person, there's going to be areas of um, occlusive shadow and 
dark shadow in the creases and stuff and lashes and whatnot that get that dark. So, you know, there's no no harm in doing that. And plus, there's her hair. She's got a lot of dark hair from um, what I've seen of her. She had very dark brown hair. Looks reads almost as black in the uh, photos. She's a very practical looking person. I think the the inked version of her that I saw is definitely a romanticized version of her. But um, I liked it because of the, the Nouveau aspect of it. And I think it's mostly faithful to the character um, of her, you know, as a, her personality. Dark Moon Lady says, I love those palettes. I just got the Etcher 19 Well Palette for gouache. Thank you for the video. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, you know, I just got this too in the mail. And I had the other one. Um, in fact, I bought one of these for 80 like two years ago. And now they're selling two of them with a tin and 40. So it's like less than half the price because you can get two for, for half the price. And that one that I got that had like 36 wells or whatever that large number was, was too many wells for such a small circle diameter. So um, I think this is the right amount um, for my comfort. And then it came with another one that has half as many wells as the other one did. So there was, um, I mean, if you don't know what I'm talking about, then go watch all my palettes video and it shows that really tiny palette with the ruby teeny wells. That ended up being too teeny for me to use even though I paint miniatures because it's hard for me to scoop my brush around and get mixes. I know some people are happy with it. If you are, that's fine. I'm not required to be happy with what you're happy with, just like you're not required to be happy with what I'm happy with. So no, no reason to tell me it's your favorite. If it's your favorite, that's great. I really like this size. I like uh, the wells of this size. So I like this one and I like the other one that's smaller. So I totally would agree with these two. But the one that's the third one that has super teeny wells and has the most ones, uh, that's too small for me to use. So. But you might like it if you're painting, I don't know, um, doll faces or something, you know? You might like it for, like, painting something that's really small. I know people say it's for something storing people paint. people are often doing. Well, I, I mean, see all the time doll, how do I paint doll faces? Well, the way they're selling this. it is that you can use it to dip into your paint so that this is supposed to be the mixing palette and the other one is supposed to be the one where you dip in for your colors. I think it's too small of an area for anybody to dip in for colors, too. So I have had trouble with that, um, whether it's for dipping or using. So I'd like to disagree with the people who said that it's easy to use for that size, but I like this one. This one is great. Um, all right. So, and I just got this like two days ago. So it just arrived in the mail just for this live stream, I guess. All right. So I think the other thing I'd like to do is add quite a bit more shadow and work around here because as we know, Muha would give a lot of shadow and I will too, to the area under and around the eye. It's what gives a lot of that mood. So I think what I'd like to do is first of all, get behind the eye in this area. So if you took the um, class with me on facial features, you'll know that the tear duct shows up on the other side of the eye like that. So it's not showing up in the ink illustration, but I can definitely toss it in. And then after that, I can come back and uh, put a bit of shadow around it so it reads even better. Um, the other thing I wanna do is take the area under the eye and give her a bit more of a lid and area that's coming down. But again, that's uh, up to you how much you want to make this look like a, a Muha piece versus um, a regular inked piece. But just make sure there's nice soft edges. That's, that's going to sell it. If you make it hard edge, it's not going to sell it very well. It's all about the soft, bloomy edges on the skin. Just like the petals have really soft forms, you want to make sure that all of the interior form shadows have to be soft. This is Art Nouveau, so you don't have to worry about... Um, the outlines being soft because you already have ink there then you've got even double ink outlines So as a result of that, there's no reason to worry about edges, you know um, um, Edge treatment with soft hard firm or lost edges But you can look at those edges in the interior of the form if not in the exterior of the form so And for her nostril I'd actually show this plane coming all the way to over here and then the bottom of her nose plane doing that so I'm gonna go ahead and blend that off and you'll see what I mean by how that's going to look the way that it should hopefully because there's a bottom plane of the nose that turns there and then there's this part of the nostril that sort of catches the blood and has that look to it and then this part it's the edge here, and we've talked about, it was just Elijah was just saying this to me last night, that he's heard the word philtrum and globella many times, and I was like, yes, yeah, because we've been teaching 
all of this uh, in, you know, facial structure, but you only see half of her globella in profile there, and the same thing for the philtrum. She doesn't have much of a nasal labial fold either, but she does have the um, tear wells here that you could put in if you wanted to. It doesn't really seem like it's something that's uh, going to show up in this portrait immediately, so I'm going to sort of put that off until I can see what I want to do with it. But um, now I'm going to come back with a little bit of that brown and re-emphasize that tear duct. Just draw it in with the paint, just like that. And so it gives me a little bit of that tear duct facing in that other direction. Also give a little bit of... She's got that little rim there, you know, that the lower eyelid. There's that highlight that sits on it. Don't ever completely eat up the color, um, the shading on that. Because before your eyelashes start, there's that little tray, you know, that has that flat edge of your eye. And it always catches the highlight a bit. So you can choose to obscure some of it, turning it away from you. But remember that because it has that sphere shape, um, you know, that edge that is curling around the sphere of the eyeball, of that cornea, you are going to want to leave a highlight right there. So I did do that. Um, now the eyeball itself is not going to be white. It should be a darker color, but because it's so small, I might not mess with it as much. But I will give it a little bit of, let's see, there is no blue here or a blue shadow. The closest to that that I might want to do is a little bit of that yellow. Um, just because, you know, it's kind of want to cast some kind of shadow on the upper part of that. So I think I might just use the brown actually might be safer. So Tasha says that mm -hmm. she's expanded her Mission Gold palette. She has one Daniel Smith tube and she likes the Mission Golds a lot better because they re-wet a lot better. The Mission Gold? Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, if those are the ones that she sent me. Yeah, those are excellent paints. They and really are. Jalari Sun says, I have a question for Hajar. What is considered a warm cool blue, does it really matter? Well, color temperature is relative. So you might have a blue that is cool or warm, but then when you put other colors next to it, it might be relatively cooler or warmer again. But just to give an example of a of a common, um, you know, if you open this drawer real quick, I want to show the color wheel, the top one, the very top one. Um, so I've got, yeah, just give me that whole stack. I've got my color wheels right here. And I do keep these very organized because, again, we have um, color theory classes. But so over here, these are the, the creative colors. So let's go to, let's say, okay. So I think this is a the Albert Durer watercolor pencils that I have. And you can see that it's got a phthalo blue. And this one's leaning towards green, so it's cooler. And then there's an ultramarine, which is warmer. Now, ultramarine is generally considered to be warmer. It has more red in it, so it's going to be the warmer blue. So any blue that has more red in it and is closer towards blue-violet, you know, is going to be a warmer blue. If it has more green in it and it heads more towards being sea-ish color, sea foamish color, the more you go that way, you might head into, um, you know, the cooler blues. And it does depend by brand because, you know, the names and, and will change. But you can see that for every brand. I have those blues organized like so and all the other colors too where the warmer blues are down here and going into the more turquoisey blue greens. Now if you want to look at a bigger color swatch so it's easier to see, here's the Sennelier colors I have and the Cinerous blue is quite cool in comparison. It looks kind of like, you know, a swimming poolish type of blue. And then here's the Thalo, which is just only slightly warmer, still on the cool side. Now these two look very blue-violet in comparison. This is the French Ultramarine and this is the Ultramarine Dreep and they're both very warm in comparison. They have more purple in them, more red in them, okay? Now, a purple or a violet is basically just a blue with a whole lot of red in it, right? It's just basically just a super, super red blue. And so that's what turns it into a violet. So any blue that has a lot of uh, purple in it or violet in it is going to be your warm blue. And anything that has more greenish in it or the absence of red will be your cooler blue. And that's how you look at that. Now we also talked about split primaries or you use a, you know, it does make a difference because if you end up having um, a triad um, like just this one that just has a red, yellow, and blue in it, you're not going to get a variety of mixes as much, but if you have a split primary triad where you've got two yellows, two blues, and two reds, each of them being one warm and one cool of each type, then you're only going to end up, you know, then you're going to end up with far more diverse mixes. Because if you have a warm blue and a cool blue, then you'll get better purples and better greens depending on which one you use, you know, and you'll get duller purples and duller greens if you use it the opposite direction. So in this case, this blue is fine, but this red is warmer. So as a result of that, you get these duller purples. Now, if you wanted to make brighter purples, you'd use this magenta. And then as a result of that, with this blue, you'd get brighter purples. These are the colors we used for the line decker gouache uh, class that we did for, um, you know, scal some weeks back. 
But yeah, and you can do the same thing with the rest of your wheels. We've got a big wheel of colors right there, so. But yeah, hopefully that answers your question. But yes, it does matter if you're using a split primary triad. Um, if you're just starting out, then, you know, down the center primary red, yellow, and blue will probably work for you. But you are going to want to, you know, sort of ask yourself what your, your needs are, you know. But starting out with a down the center red, yellow, and blue is fine. And then having a warm and cool of a red, yellow, and blue is great. And then along with that, if you've got an earth color, um, you like an ochre and a brown, and then a Payne's gray, then you're pretty much good to go for mixing whatever color you want. Um, I have other color wheel videos. There's ones where I show the minimal travel tins for Schmincke and Cellier. Check those out and you'll understand um, the colors that you have in there. That You know, your 12 colors that you can use for basically mixing anything. Alright, so we've got um, this going on right here. Okay, let's, that's right there. I, got, I like the lips. Don't want to do too much with that. You know, remember, we're thinking Muha. So if you think Muha, Muha didn't like go on here and slap the most shadows in the world everywhere. So I'm trying to be careful with the amount of shading that I'm putting on here. All right, so I've made that darker. This does make everything else look a little bit lighter, so I will come back in and darken up her face um, shadow. And also, I mean, Muha wasn't much of a, I'm adding blush to people person. You know, he, there wasn't much blush going on. So I'm gonna be careful about that, but I might add um, more shadow um, in the areas where it's coming back down and around, just the areas where I felt like there was going to be, the skin is actually occluded and the background and there's a, a nice cast shadow going on. So I'll go ahead and do that down here. Oh, by the way, I finally got a chance to redo my YouTube channel. So all the descriptions and playlists and everything are updated. So as a result of that, there's a lot of videos that were unlisted or private before because you know they were doing the whole uh, channel reviews to see if you had material for kids or not as they changed those rules. So a lot of my videos, I mean, I've got more than 200 or like around 250. Um, all the ones that were public before are now back to being public. Um, so if you were trying to look for some videos and couldn't find them before earlier in the year, um, everything is back to being public now. Um, everything is, is okay. My channel, I think, was reviewed and as expected. Probably also because it's just a medium-sized channel as well. It's not like some big channel. But there isn't a, they didn't take anything down and they didn't, you know, I wasn't doing anything wrong. I wasn't trying to sell, sell drugs to kids or something. So it's all right. So you've been painting for about an hour. Do you want to tell any of the folks who are new about the classes that you're going to be teaching? Um, you can tell them. Okay, you want me to do it. I was wanting to paint. That's why. Okay, all right. So let's see. I've got a class coming up this weekend using the Zorn palette. We're going to be doing a portrait, um, the blue veil. So we'll be painting this one again. Um, he's got a link up there that you can look at. So you'd end up, uh, you know, uh, doing this painting with me in gouache using the tiling technique. And then we're going to be using the Zorn uh, limited palette, which is this palette of colors that was made famous by Swedish master painter Anders Zorn. And we're going to be doing that this weekend. And then after that, um, I've made some attempts to reschedule the class that we were doing for drawing, um, you know, ink drawing, five ways to draw anything. We're going to be using Albertine Bills, grids, proportional divisors, freehand, stack sketching, all that stuff, all that good stuff. And um, we're going to be doing um, Alice in Wonderland characters. We're going to be doing a Charles Anna Gibson, Gibson girl, and we're going to be doing a fantasy castle um, from a fairy tale. And it's going to be nice, realistic stuff too. And all that is very easy to check out with. Uh, the drawing class is only $15. The scale class is $35. And the links are going to be right there. If I do any solo classes, they can always be less because um, I'm not working with an institution. So when I do the solo classes on my own, they can always be more affordable. And I think I might head in that direction because it's easier for me to manage my schedule and links and all that other kind of stuff like that. So I think it might be what I settle on for uh, working on, um, you know, because I tried Patreon and I had some problems with that. I didn't like Skillshare at all because they were terribly corrupt. And um, I think that doing it this way is probably going to end up being the best, which is that, you know, there isn't any platform apart from YouTube. And that way you don't have to worry about people having to go sign up for other things and all that jazz. So I think that'll work out better. Okay, I think I'll put a little bit more yellow into her face. I think this shadow area has gotten quite dark. So I think what I'll do is I'll wait until all of this is dried and then come back and reassess the face. I obviously am going to want to put in some shadow area along the the hairline there. In fact, let's just do that before we stop so that we have some guideline for when we're doing the hair. And so when you do a, a hard edge like this along a face, don't leave it there for too long. Make sure you bring in your 
brush and wipe that down with the other side, you know, the other side with a damp brush, because you're not going to want to leave that there for too long, otherwise you'll get that wet on dry hard edge, which is good for some areas, but definitely not for it a form shadow on skin. So I've got that taken care of and I'm going to come back around and reassess some of these other areas. But yeah, yeah, I was planning on moving forward with some drawing and painting and color theory classes. So Diane wants to know when you're not filming, do you use natural or artificial light while painting? Well, I use both. I've got a big bay window that I, my desk is parked in front of and I use that during the day. At nighttime, I use the artificial light. But, um, you know, you have to consider that when your piece is scanned, it's going to be scanned in artificial light in your scanner. And it's also going to be hung if you hang it in a gallery in artificial light. So it's good to um, use natural light, but also I think to use a little bit of that uh, artificial light as well because it's going to affect how your piece looks in the end ultimately. Um, because that's how you scan it and that's how, how, you, how it's displayed in galleries and such. All right, so... Um, you should also let people know to like and subscribe. You're supposed to remember as a YouTube person, you're supposed to say that about every two minutes. Okay, well, you can tell them to like and subscribe. But, um, but yeah, you can like, like and subscribe <laughs> if you like the video. And um, hopefully you'll subscribe mm -hmm. so you can see more. But you're like, so good at YouTubing. Yeah, I'm just trying to think about the painting. I'm I'm more interested in the important stuff. Okay, so let's see. So with the hair, I think we're going to again go in a muha way. And I think the easiest way to do this is to throw in all of uh, the light tendrils first. So I think the color of the hair, I want it to be this, this brown, that dark brown. And then some of them, the hair to be like that greenish yellow color or maybe that yellow color. Because, you know, that was the kind of, uh, you know, Art Nouveau mood you have where you've got like tendrils of the different hair. So I think I might do that. So let me see if I want to do it like that or, yeah, let's start with that one first then. Let's see. Um, it's, it's also good because this hair is not realistic looking. So it's quite easy to follow along with, you know. So if anybody has problems with painting hair... Um, the Nouveau way of painting hair is really not that difficult. So I'm going to go ahead and put the, the yellow in and once you end up having a few different colors going on it actually mixes together to make it quite pretty and you can always come back in and stripe in some of them darker so it's fine if you start in lighter, you know. Um, I might even paint the whole thing in the light color and then come back in and make it darker so that way it's easier. So let's do that. The yellow is quite opaque so it does affect the brown. That's the only reason why I would like maybe not do that if I was in less of a hurry is because, you know, yellow ochre is quite opaque. So, but if it does affect my um, brown too much, then I might just lift it up. And again, if it's an opaque color, it, it lifts readily as well. So you sort of get that bonus in both directions, but it could be a plus or a minus depending on how you work on it. But I'm going to go ahead and get a lot of that in. And again, it's sort of my own hair, but I used uh, Art Nouveau hair as a as an inspiration so it can't quite follow any one particular thing because it's kind of her hairdo but in an Art Nouveau style so you can only sort of have that as a leaping pad with that hair so let's get that part of it there and she was not a blonde lady she had very dark brown hair so let's go ahead and mix that color over here what kind of jokes are you making? I'm saying nothing no jokes I saw Diane say LOL, so... I think she was just... I think she just accidentally typed that. She accidentally typed LOL? Yeah. Yeah, right. What are you guys laughing about? Oh, I, I told people to like and subscribe in all caps. Oh, okay. And then I said that the reason why you don't... You don't seem to get it, that YouTube isn't about creating quality content. It's about constantly telling the people who watch your videos to press those buttons. Yes, this is true. But I don't seem to understand that yet. Well, I mean, I've been on here for five years. If I don't understand it by now, I don't think I will. I think it's over. I think we should just have the small group of merry men that we have and ladies and say, okay, we're here for art quality. Oh, ooh, I really like this brown. Doesn't this look like just the most yummy brown there? That's a really nice auburn type brown. So, um, if only um, all that stuff that had to do with online stuff had to do was as fun as color and painting. That's all I can say. Okay, all right. So let's see. I've got these dark areas, and I think one of the things we want to do is sort of throw in major dark areas the way that uh, a muha would, and that is to take these um, sort of, you know, smaller areas in between, and it's kind of going to be a bit of guesswork. So again, the way you would do this is you draw it all sort of swirly arabesques and, you know, very unrealistic in how the hair is falling. And... Um, um, what you're going to do after that is then take the, the chunks that you 
that sort of stand out to you that might look good as a dark and then throw that in once and then after that you sort of have to after, sort of follow along and say okay not the one next to it but skip one and go over one and then if something doesn't look good then you'll have to lift it out or cover it up with a different color um, this is watercolor so mostly it would be lifting um, I'm not wearing a glove on my hand so that also means that if I smear this that I'd have to be careful about that. You could also fade off the color a bit too so you could kind of come back around on this corner and fade so that it fades into the lighter color on this side so it depends on how you want to do that as a highlight. Um, you know Muha didn't do that very much so again you'd have to do it selectively. Um, and we're not being slaves to Muha but I did want to do this in an authentic Art Nouveau style and Alphonse Muha was the most sort of well-known and it remains the most well-known style of that period, so when it comes to Art Nouveau, so. All right, I like those two, and I think the that'll sort of dictate how this curve shows up, and I think maybe this one here should also be dark. And the other thing you can do is throw in a third color, and I will. I'm trying to think about how I can make this even dingier. So I guess you'd have to add green in to make it quite a bit dingier. So I will. I'll get a little bit of that green in and mix it in the corner there. Probably best to do all of your single brown color at once because, you know, you might end up not uh, having the capacity to do that if you skip, uh, you know, if you mix all your color up. I mean, but there's only a few colors, so it's actually not going to be that that difficult to to mix it up again. So I'm going to take this greenish color now and take it over into the yellow area, but I'm going to leave that yellow as a highlight. So I'm going to go ahead and pull it along one side of it, like so. I can feel my hand dangerously resting on her chin. It's going to end up bl blurring into the stupid face if I pick up any paint. So just keep that in mind. I should do as I say and not as I do, and either put the glove on or put a piece of paper down, is what I should be doing. Let me get a piece of paper if I can find one. I seem to write on all the backs of my pieces of papers, that's the problem, so it's always distracting. I'm just going to tuck this under her face, like so. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and go around the edge of it with a damp brush. And see how that makes that, that soft blending away edge? It gives me that form shadow. And just remember your brush has to be slightly damp. If it's too wet, you're going to get a back bleed or a bloom, so don't do that. But see how this limited palette can be used in an Art Nouveau style? It could be used in a gouache realistic style. It can be used in a botanical painting. I mean, that other piece that I did that I was showing is in a completely different style. I mean, this is a... A completely different style it's more realistic I mean down here it's not because it's deco and but up here it is but you can use a lot of these limited color schemes and they give such amazing mood regardless of the style of your piece and now my two favorite periods of course of painting are Nouveau Art Nouveau and Art Deco so my art falls into those categories and of the golden age and you know with that sort of realism that happens with the decoration that's what I like I like realism with decoration so I like stylized realism um, all right, so in this one up here, you can make the shadows go in one direction. So this green could be on this side and fade to yellow. Um, I'd actually like it to come in from the other side, though, because it's like you can change that, just like with hair. I mean, this is stylized. You have way more license than you would if this was real hair. <laughs> you know, if this was a, a more realistic painting, like, say, in the Lion Decker style, you know, like in a Norman Rockwell, Lion Decker, John William Waterhouse type style. All those people have different styles of their own, but they're all way more realistic than what we're doing here. And I could then shift this, I can make it come up across and then go around the corner to match that. Just just like I can see a piece of candy, like I'm imagining a piece of candy cane or twisted sugar candy. And that's how I feel like the highlight would fall along that. And if you haven't imagined that, that's because you have not painted as many candy canes as I have. If you know anything about me at all, you know I've painted far too many peppermint candies and candy canes, so. That's how I know that part of it will work out. And I can make a darker color. But see how it makes all the difference? Now I've got three different colors floating in the hair and it's going to make it way more stylized than, um, you know, is, the, is this still open? I want to put that on there. So see how it's a much bigger difference, you know, in this original piece versus just having 
Okay, sorry. I need to get this bigger. Okay, so I just want to zoom in on the hair there. And you can see that there is a inky highlight. So we're going to try to retain that on those two areas. But we're not following that part at all because it's just basically a dark mass. We've turned it into Art Nouveau hair. It's not, um, you know, a period ink illustration, which is what this is. It's very sort of like Victorian era ink illustration. So frankly, I think this is a lot more fun. And um, of course, it also makes it more original, right? It's going to be less original if you just copy the ink illustration. So that's why I wanted to put her in front of her um, data diagram. And it's called Nightingale's Rose, so hence the roses. And in the other tribute piece, there was a nightingale because it's her namesake bird. And this case is just a portrait of her in an Art Nouveau style with the roses, with the metal in her hair. Very ostentatious in some ways, you know, but that's part of what Nouveau is about, you know? It's very ostentatious, so... Art Nouveau is very decorative. And see, I'm adding in a few tendrils extra just with my paint here. Smooth them out, leave them. Heather wants you to do a class on painting hair and drawing hair. Well, if we do any portraits, you'll always get that section on hair. I don't know if anybody would want to take a class just on hair, but if there's enough people who want to sign up, I'd be happy to teach it. But yeah, we did a class on facial features. Maybe if we do a follow-up on facial features, we can do one that includes hair as well. You know, so hair and facial features. Or perhaps you could do a class on textures differently, right? So you could talk about fabrics and hair. And oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I love textures, yeah. Well, I mean, that's kind that's of... That's a classic yeah. art class. Well, I mean, it's. I think it's very useful because I think most people don't uh, think very carefully if they're just starting out just how if they master different types of textures, you know, shiny ones, uh, smooth ones, hairy ones, and all those different things, that ha what a difference Especially if you're doing yeah. more than just showing sort of realistic or one form, but you're also showing sort of like this romantic mm -hmm. art deco and things like that. The nouveau yeah, no, I, like I think that. that's also more fun because I think that if you want to take a realistic hair or, um, you know, face or futures class, you could just buy yourself a book from Andrew Loomis or all those other people and then learn how to do that in pencil and charcoal. But make it slightly more, um, you know, stylized makes it so much more fun. Yeah, so maybe we can do different styles of hair too, you know, so from different periods. That, that would make it fun for me. Because I always like to do a class that I would like to take. If it sounds boring to me, then I don't want to teach it, much less take it, you know? So I think the different styles of hair would be a great idea. Uh, I do think people struggle with, with hair, too. That's That's been my experience, is that people struggle with hair. So let's bring some of that brown back. But I really like how that's turning out. I don't want it to look more blonde than brown, which is a danger if we put in too much of that brown. Um, I mean, too little of that brown and too much of that green over the yellow. So let's try to make sure we emphasize that. Now I'm trying to figure out if I add even more red to this, I can come back in and make that a shade darker. I mean, hopefully I can. I'm sort of, you know, pushing my limited uh, shadows here. So that's what you have to do with the limited color ranges. I'm, I, I can't add black. I can't add any other blue or gray. So in order to keep this mood, I have to work with these colors. And I don't think I get any darker than this, except for by adding a bit more red. So I can maybe come back in and do that. But let's go ahead and try to figure out the different areas where I want to still put in this shadow. And if there's a few of these shapes that I might want to lose, there's nothing wrong with that either. I can add shapes in here or maybe lose a few depending on... Like down here, I just feel like this area should be dark, but it's not connected to this area, so I'm just going to make up a new area. I mean, I'm the one who drew this picture, right? So I can change it how I want. And I'm going to go back in to this area up here and darken this, because this is, see now, this is going to look even darker with that second pass. So when you're doing this kind of shading too, the wet on dry, that's like almost using watercolor like gouache in those areas. The difference is, is everywhere else you've used it very transparent and done the bleeds and blooms and everything. But in this case, you're going to go ahead and, you know, have some areas that are very dark. And that's where the paint's basically going to be neat from the tube, right? It's just about as dark as it can get. The woodpecker outside agrees. Boy, those woodpeckers are chatty birds. It's perfectly fun to have a woodpecker, as long as you don't have a house that is going to chew all up. If it, you know, if you're living in an area where it's going to chew up your house, then they're not so nice to have around. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and actually go ahead and finish that. I was going to leave that highlight there. I liked it. You know, it's like sacrificing something I think that's pretty for the sake of the balance of it. So sometimes you'll end up with an effect that's pretty, but you have to lose it because it just doesn't work for the balance of the rest of the piece. So I was trying to keep that, but just couldn't. All right, so I'm going to keep doing that. 
I'm trying to figure out the balance of this. I do think another area here, I think that should also... This area here, I can't imagine how I can leave all of that this color. Because again, I don't want it to look like she's got blonde hair. That's very dangerous with a piece like this because you're trying to do a historical figure. So I don't want her to end up having blonde hair. So as much as that's fun with the ochre and that green, I have to eat some of that up, you know? It just has to go away. All right, and I'm gonna come back around to this side and just invent a line on this side too. And then the rest of it, I'm gonna come back in with the green shading and see how that works. But I think that's starting to look a bit more like it's brown and not green. And do the same thing in the back right here. But this Nouveau hair is quite a bit different than um, realistic hair. So if you have realistic hair, it ends up looking very um, different in how you do the shading. This is this is actually a lot easier than, than realistic hair. And you'll see me do that too. Um, like I said, if you take the the class uh, this weekend, it's, I think it's got a little bit more realistic hair, obviously, than this one. Because it's an um, impressionist realism piece by Edmund Tarbell that we're doing a study of this weekend. Okay, so quite dark. Um, I think I've also noticed for the watercolor sticks, and maybe this is not other people's experience depending on how thick you use them, but they can actually go quite gouache if you want because of the little slightly bit of waxy binder that they've got to hold them into a stick. I think the colors, uh, you know, can be used as gouache if you really wanted to do that. Now I'm not, I'm using this mostly as watercolor, but I'm just saying that if you wanted to, you could. Okay, so I think in here now I'm just gonna sort of intermittently figure out the darks. In this case, let's blend towards that. And I think once I get done with the bun part of it, I'll go back to a flower. So again, I can show people a variety of the, the stuff that we're doing in case I don't, you know, because I probably won't finish. You said I've already been doing this for an hour? It's been an hour and 20 minutes now. Okay. When's your next meeting? Four o'clock. Okay, so I've got half an hour then to do that. Um, that would make it a two-hour stream instead of a, a one-hour stream. That always happens with me. But I don't, I don't see how to stop it. Once I get started, it's a lot of fun. No, it's really true. Sometimes I look forward to this, and when I start doing it, I think to myself, I wish I could just do this all day. I wish I had no health problems, no time scheduling conflicts, no none of the other stuff that keeps you from doing your art. I could really just do art all day if I didn't have any pain issues or other things to do in my schedule. Okay, so I've got that. I'm going to come back in and do the greens, and then after that we'll move on to... And that's how I do the rest of her hair, too. And what do you say? Do you think it reads as blonde or green? Or blue or brown? Brownish? Okay. As long as you feel like it does, then, then we're okay. You always come back and add uh, more of one color or the other if you feel like it's not. The important thing is is that when it's done, it looks like she or you're trying to draw a brunette because, like I said, that was who she is. That's the hair color she had. Not just a little bit. She had quite dark hair, so I'm a little bit worried about some of those yellow highlights. I might make them green and make the green shadow brown just to eat those up a bit more. Like so. Make them a slightly dirtier yellow, you know, so that way they're still a low light, but not a, a blonde low light. Okay. I think I can come back and play around with the rest of it later. I think here we might want to dampen that down a bit and all that. Okay, let's work on some other parts of it. I could say it was pretty easy to work on her face because she's in profile, another one of these profile pieces. And it says, who cares about housework and needs to eat, do artwork all day? I know. <laughs> who wants to do anything but this all day? All right, so let's see, I think I'd make the bottom part of this um, red. I think that's what I've decided is I like to do the metal. Um, the bars and the bar chart, I think I can color in with a, a looser thing. In this case, when I did the bar chart, I did solid fills for this part of it. 
Then I did like salt effects for that part of it. And then I added roses because, you know, of course, it's a blank bar chart. So it was just solid color. So in order to make it decorative, I added in those deco roses. In this case, I added Art Nouveau style roses. And so I'm going to color them like that rose up there and just do that for the rest of it. But I'm trying to figure out, and in fact, I might have to come back and re-ink it because you can kind of see the inks faded in some places. But if you like the faded ink look, then it sometimes is better to leave it because when you go back over to ink it, it sometimes it gets very clumsy. Um, dark, too dark. Um, so, you know, it just depends. I think what I'll do now, because I'm actually happy with the color with her face and how it dried, I might consider adding a bit more shadow there once all the hair is done and it's relatively lighter or darker. You don't want to rush those kinds of things. So let's work on her costume, I'd say. And I think based on the colors I've got, we can sort of map out real quick. Um, let me see, I've got a little pencil here. So let's do a little um, thumbnail. This is something you should probably do ahead of time and not now. But let's just say we've got a little thumbnail um, of like this shape. Okay, and it doesn't have to be very exact. It just has to be like this. And then we've got a head and hair. And we've got the body here, and I'm not trying at all to draw anything, so just the shapes here. I'm going to draw um, the bars. Okay, so now I'm trying to figure out the colors I want for that. And I think what I'd, I think what I'd like here is, obviously the hair is going to be brown. Right, so that's going to be mostly brown. And we're going to end up, this is a, a good way to end up figuring out how you're going to do your color balance and if it's not good you should do it again obviously but so this is a brown and I think the metal is going to be yellow probably should have made this uh, thumbnail just a little bit prettier just because it's appearing on screen but my other thumbnails look like this if you care to see them they look really tiny that's my jelly made thumbnail for the colors on there and that's my Penelope thumbnail right there so it's you know they're always really small and ugly I just need to get the color balance I'm not much of a giant thumbnail person Okay, so and then I've got the skin color, which is like this color, and it comes down the neck. And then we've got um, the roses, which I thought were going to be a mix of like this yellowish red orange. And so I think the radial bars, I think I might make these red, because I think that's that'll pop out as a nice dark red. And then after that, I will make um, the background more yellow, because I think this is the only place where I'll get that dark pop of red. Um, but I might try to do it in some kind of, um, that's what I was trying to figure out is what color I wanted those. So let's do those in red right here. Again, I don't know if that'll fit the mood of that. And then the metal in her hair has a little bit of red right there. And again, I don't want it to look like a head wound, but you know. It's, well, it's just, I mean, it just you looks... You keep saying that it doesn't look anything like a head wound. Okay, good. Well, I just feel like, I just feel like there's oh, a lot, it's like a weird amount of red here, and it's a, it's a data viz about wars and wounds, that's all, so that's why it makes me think that. Uh, <laughs> I think I'll make her outfit green. Does that sound good? Because there's no other really color. That's that's the other nice thing about having just three colors. You're like, so what color should I use? Well, so you've got the option between, you know, this color, that color, and that color, and that's it. Now, you can have shadows in between, but really there's not much else that can change. I'll make that rose, um, that pinkish, reddish color again. You can have some really um, nice, subtle colors in there. So it's not gonna be like just the garish red. I'm just trying to figure out the, the basics here. And I think I'll make, make an orangish color here for, let's see, for the collar. A little bit of shadow on the collar like that. And that will be the color of that. And the scarf, I think, can be red again, okay? So let's try that. Let's try that the red, red, green, and then there's going to be the orange in the background. So let's say the majority of the background is going to be like different colored roses. That's going to kind of read as orange is what's going to end up happening because, you know, it's going to sort of average out with a little bit of green, a little bit of red, a little bit of the yellow, and I think it'll average out to look like an orange. So I think that's basically what the piece is going to look like. I do like that balance. I'll take some of the green into the buds. So you'll end up seeing some of the buds here in green, but see, it's just, you know, nice to have a little bit of that um, idea of how this is going to end up looking. So I think, yeah, I think that's a, a nice uh, balance of that. It's very ugly, but very useful. Okay, so let's see. Let's go ahead and start with the, the, the blouse now. And I think I'm going to do that wet and wet. It'll be a nice, fun way to do it again, because this is Naveau, and Naveau doesn't have any kind of real realism and all the ink lines are holding it together so again that's a lot more fun 
than if you had to do this um, with pure watercolor where you had to really define all your shapes. I've done a lot of that thinking with the fabric and with how everything is being pulled together and the shadows on here. I did it all already with the, the ink and the drawing. So my signature is there too, so I don't want to completely occlude that. I've had that happen before where I've plotted it someplace and come back later and it just kind of disappears. So it's something that you have to sort of work on. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and pop that in and then let that do its own bleeding with that lovely wet and wet. Now you're going to ask me, well, what about these stems? Well, in this case, I'd make the stems a dryish yellow green and maybe I'll add more red shadow underneath uh, this green area right here. So there's ways to work around that so that it doesn't mix into itself, you know? And I'm just letting it be loose, just like that. And I think probably it would be even better as an idea if I made it all light green first, because I don't think I want it to read like a light blouse with green shadows. I want it to read like a green blouse with darker green shadows. So therefore I would obliterate most of the white highlights here. And just make sure I'm not heading out to the white there. And that scarf I wanted to make red. Okay, now try again with the uh, the darkers, and now they should sort of read more like green shadows. Are you reading any of the comments? Diane said she's got to go. That's the only new comment since Heather's comment. Okay, well, thanks for showing up, Diane. I know she's in Florida where it's like a few hours ahead, so thanks for showing up, and th this will be up on the rewatch. Like I said, I did an overhaul of the channel, so a lot of the videos are back where they're supposed to be. Yeah, this is easy and fun. That's a great thing about ink pieces is that they can go so fast once you make up your mind. Like, if I already knew where all the colors were going, this would have been even faster. You know, I sort of did that on the air. I could have given it a bit more thought ahead of time, but I didn't really know which piece I wanted to do, and this piece I sort of had sitting around. I remember Heather and a few other people had wanted me to do this, and so I thought, okay, how about this piece? But I had not decided on all the colors yet, so, you know, hence a little bit of that waiting around to, to figure it out. But I think that's looking good. And then now on this side, let's do... You can make this even more morose, you know? You could actually make this so it had even duller colors and looked more serious, maybe do it all in blues or, or grays. And you know, and by that I don't mean like bright blues, I mean like quite dull. And that would work as well. This serpentine green is kind of this, um, you know, I think it's a mineral color from Daniel Smith, but what's nice about it is it's got like this olivish green, already lower intensity color. It's not like a very bright green, so it works immediately to look serious. It doesn't look like a playful color. It's a it's a lovely mood color. Okay, I got that. I think that's working well all the way around. I think this is still her collar um, that works out. I think I'll make that part of the, the red scarf that's actually working its way around. And then now I'll use the uh, ochre to make the, the collar appear. And then once this is dry, we'll come back in here with the, the red. Now there's always many renditions of the same piece. I could have gone in a different direction and made this orange or yellow or red and not green, so it all depends on, you know, what you choose. Probably the better idea would be to, at least for this piece, I don't, I wasn't that concerned because I felt like any of those combinations would be equally okay to me because um, I already have a very limited palette and plus it's a Nouveau piece so I'm not really super concerned with where the colors are going. I'm letting most of the ink carry the day. But if you really wanted to, you could sit down and sort of think about where these colors are going to go before you get on to here and just start, uh, choose one rendition. You know, do, do a little thumbnails of a few different versions of it is what I'm saying before you sort of decide on one or the other. Now, because your skin has a lot of red in it, I'm not going to, I mean, that's part of what's helping me make these decisions is that skin has red in it, so I'm not going to make her a red blouse. Um, hair has brown in it, so I'm not going to make this brown. You know, those kinds of decisions are what are helping me make the colors the color choices because I don't want the colors to be completely the same everywhere because it's already a limited palette and I don't want it to be um, just not thoughtful. It can't be thoughtless about where I'm plopping these colors and how I'm using them. I 
I think what I look forward to doing with the Zorn palette for, um, you know, and teaching people how to do that is that it can be used for so many skin colors. You know, you can use it for light to dark skin colors. You can use it for very effective portraits of um, any background and with great variegation of mood just with those colors that are in the Zorn palette. I think that's why it's always been um, one of the palettes that people use in ateliers to, to teach people how to do portraits to start out with. I mean, after monochromatic, because, you know, sometimes you can just do a brown or, um, you know, like a sanguine or charcoal, so just a brown or just a black if you want to start out doing uh, portrait sketches and stuff. But, you know, the best thing to do after that is just to work with a few colors instead of a ton of colors. You don't have to also worry about a lot of color choices on top of learning how to do a portrait and paint. And that's why I think the Zorn color palette is a great choice is because you don't have a bazillion colors to choose from, you know? You've basically got your red, your ochre, which is already, um, you know, earthy and kind of opaque, and then the black for your, to get your shadows up real dark, and then white for highlights, and that's it. You know, black, white, red, and yellow. Very limited. Okay, I've got all of that. I think I'm okay with everything. I could even make this scarf down here, um, not red, but I think I'd prefer to make it red for, there's gonna be a little bit of red in that metal, and I think when it comes down here and it sort of bounces off of this bottom part right here is a bookend. I like bookending colors. I've used that term probably not for a long time in a video, but I do use it subconsciously in my head. But if you watch any of my older videos, you'll talk, you know, you'll you'll hear me say um, bookending colors. And this is what I mean, which is that if you have a color in one part of a piece, then, you know, unless it's meant to be an accent color, it doesn't show up anywhere else. And we've talked about that as a color scheme variation. Then what you'd want to do is bookend it someplace else. So it doesn't look like it's just completely standing out. Um, and it can do that, but then it would be an accent color, so otherwise you would want to bookend it in some other area. Okay, random shadows, wet and wet. Very easy to paint in if you're working in a Nouveau style. I mean, that's probably one of the reasons uh, Luha went in that direction, is because for commercial work, we had to do posters for people and ads and stuff. The painting part of this is quite fast. As soon as you get past the drafting, it's quite fast, you know? Um, and this is looking like it's quite dark. It'll dry down a little bit more when it does that. And then I've got the roses. But, um, I think that's looking good to me. Does anybody have any questions? I want to, I want to make sure that... Not yet. I, okay. I'm going to make sure that there's questions that are answered if we're going forward. I do like the shadows on the face. I'm kind of concerned about jumping in and making them darker when I haven't done the rest of the hair. So I'm not going to do that. And I think I'll work a little bit on, um, another one of the roses. How's that? So let's do that. So we're calling this rose right here. <laughs> Talk and paint at the same time because I have to. <laughs> That's the easy answer. But yes, it would be much easier to paint silently. But for years and years and years, I think I've taught for a decade. The first four years I was teaching, I taught at a university. And after that, I taught both in person and online. And um, you just have to get used to it. You just have to get used to doing both at the same time. Because otherwise, I mean, I've taken classes with people when I was at school who when they were working out a math problem or something couldn't talk and then you had to sort of wait and um, usually teachers get used to it. They talk and do like calculus problems which is what I taught, one of the classes uh, I taught for years was calculus because I was a physics major and then a history um, you know major in, in grad school so I had history degrees and um, physics degrees and I think if you can talk while you're teaching that then you can talk while you're teaching art is gets the short answer which is that if you can do it while you're doing that then you should be able to do it while you're doing something like painting. Uh, uh, maybe it's also because it's a different part of your brain, you know, where when you're painting, it's it's actually a little bit easier because it's a different part of your brain, or it could be a little bit harder. Depends on who you are, right? All right, so in this case, I'm gonna just let that fade up to that rose. Um, I have a nice video on my channel from a while back about painting different types of flowers in ink and wash, and I also have, um, and that's quite an old video. It's before I got my um, new camera, but it's still off of a Canon Vixia camera. It's a better than a stream quality. And um, there's also another video that I did where I taught people how to do uh, the ink and wash lily. And so that's also on YouTube. So if you want to see a bigger flower in detail, then you can definitely see me do that as well. And I'm going to get a little bit of this in here. I'm getting the darkest bits of what I feel like would be the darkest bits. that I'd feel it curling in from the outside and then come back in. So there's two ways to do this. You can have the wet on wet and it gives you that soft edge automatically or you can put it on wet on dry like this and then come back with a damp brush and then just tug the paint along. Both will work. One will give you a more 
deliberate edge and the other one will give you a more random edge so it's just up to you how you end up making that uh, choice as to what you want for that particular area for smaller areas you're, you're probably better served doing the the wet on dry but you can definitely put in the water like this just a teeny amount and then come back in with that paint and do so anyway just like just like that oh could you give me that newspaper I wanted to show that newspaper to anybody who didn't get to see it so I have this on my Instagram too you can look at it but it was a lot of fun this last week a few days ago they published a newspaper article with me in it and it's uh, in the San Santa Cruz uh, San Sentinel which is the, the newspaper of Santa Cruz got this article in the art section that says live stream art and there's a picture that uh, the news photographer took of me and then um, detail about um, my teaching and my classes in there and to me um, it's a, a great you know pleasure to be in there but it also makes me sad because you can see like at the top it says Newsom state can handle spike right the corona spike and then you know like police stories and stuff like that and you know it just goes to show you we're living in such a tough world we're trying to do art and do normal things and there's also all sorts of scary things going on so we're all in this together hopefully we can all be nicer to each other because it does seem like people are finding more ways to be divisive than they are to be united and I've always um, and I studied international history and diplomatic relations and I like things and um, a stance that unites people more than it divides so I wish people were friendlier right now to each other but that's one of the reasons why I like art is I can bring different cultures and uh, different people together it's easier to do so in this field than it is in some others but anyway that's in the paper you can see the details of that on their website and also um, on my Instagram where I posted the the photo and the story as well I'm glad I could grab it off of online actually because the online version, um, I mean the in, the in print per, uh, you know, uh, printed version is not as nice as uh, the online photo and article. So that's because we're all spoiled and now have grown up in an age of non-print media. The digital media is so much uh, sharper, right? So, so here are these little flower, the, the flower petals. You can see how I'm getting that in and each petal deserves its own little time. Um, you know, it's singing its own little song on, of its color, so you don't want to consolidate all of those. And you can, of course, if you wanted to make it a simple pass, but I don't. I wanted it to be nicer than that. Um, and so I'm doing each petal on its own, so you can go ahead and see how that goes. And like I said, you can put a little bit of water in like I'm doing right here. Not too much, just has to show up as a shiny sheen on the paper, but not a puddle. If you have a puddle, it's too much. And then I'm going to go ahead and put that yellow in and it gives me that nice soft edge and I can always exaggerate that edge by tapping in a bit more water or leave it like so. And I think I've got another area over here that could be yellow. And like I said, it's kind of semi-winging it and semi-looking at real roses and illustrations of roses in Nouveau. You can, you know, it's not, it's not actually an exact rose from any which area so I have to sort of like figure out how to make this up. I did use uh, a combination of seeing how Muha did roses mixed with roses online to come up with the style of these because just like I did Art Deco roses on the other Nightingale piece I wanted to have an Art Nouveau flair to this one just like I wanted to have an Art Deco flair for that one so I did go and look up um, how people were drawing roses during this period in order to give it that because if I was doing these on my own I think they'd be a lot more realistic and obviously without the ink because I do botanical painting as well, so. Just have to sort of be faithful to the period, but see how easy that is and gives you that automatic punch of botanical right there. You know, watercolor was born to do botanicals. It's very easy to do botanicals with watercolor. And if you got the ink there, then it's not that much different than if you were just coloring in a preset page. It's really that easy. As long as you've got your water control in mind, you know? If you can't control your water then you're gonna have to get that practice in to be able to control that before you can have as much fun with water um, with the watercolor as you as you wouldn't normally but you know the looser you paint that's not going to be as important but if you paint in more detail like I do then you're gonna want to get some control of your medium before you do so you can start with larger pieces as well a larger piece will need less control um, I, I tend to paint smaller it gets me done faster um, easier to store my pieces, easier to stream them on camera. So I've sort of gotten into the habit of drawing smaller um, the longer I've painted for those all those reasons together. 
but um, you know certainly this piece doesn't have to be at this size it can also be at a 9 by 12 or 12 by 18 size it just take longer to get done but it would leave room for more mistakes right so you could sort of bleed out more in different places and it wouldn't uh, affect it as much as it would on a smaller size uh, painting okay so I've got that in I'm trying to figure out if I want any of these other petals to be a straight yellow or a brighter red. Kind of has to have to ask yourself what the balance is that you're looking for, right? So over here I feel like the balance is asking me to have a little bit more dark on this area, so I'm gonna just go ahead and throw in some dark here. And the nice thing about the the red and the ochre is between them you can make a red um, and a yellow ochreish sort of warm, you know, sort of uh, mustard yellow and also make that low chroma dusky rose potter's pink orange and I think that's great colors for roses you know very nice subtle colors for roses in fact you can see those colors there I might add a little bit of them into her actual costumes instead of this being just red or just green I might add a little bit more shadows just to give it a bit more variegation you kind of see it happening everywhere else but on the other hand it might be too much noise you know there's always already a lot of noise in the petals and also in the hair and also in the metal so I might want to leave a little bit more clean um, solid color down here just to give your eye some rest you know so that's the kind of thing that I'm going to consider that when I'm finishing this up again better considered if you were doing this um, in your actual thumbnails it's better to consider it at that stage but if you haven't considered it then then you can you know just continue to consider it as you're painting where does your eye need rest where is there too much noise whether it's color and texture um where is there too little of that you know so just operate accordingly and move around and see what looks good and if something doesn't then go and uh, lift it up or fix it or cover it up you know it's not the end of the world some of this is just random choice some of it is uh, premeditated. That's going to happen for a piece that doesn't have um, a full reference, you know, where you're making a lot of it up. You know, sometimes you have original pieces, but they're using more of a photo, so that's not going to be um, as necessary. For this piece, there is uh, a lot of original aspect to it. Like I said, I don't really have any grounded roses that I can look at to say okay how do I exactly want this painted my the brush and the, uh, the hair in this brush is really doing this weird uh, splayed out thing it's because I left it on my towel for too many days don't do that because as it rolls around on the towel the hair starts to splay out as it catches in the fiber of the towel so that's why I like to just put it in the Tupperware drawer that I have in my tabaret leaving it out on a felt or a um, any other kind of towel it makes the hairs after a while, you might not think it, but after a while it'll start to do that. So I'm going to have to put some gum arabic in this brush and let it dry in a solid, you know, um, pulled together um, shape so that it can stop doing that because otherwise as it dries it keeps splaying out. But that's the way to help your brush if that happens. Let's put some gum arabic or honey or glycerin, even corn syrup. Just let it dry with that in it and then that should help. You can also dunk it, it's not good for it, but you can dunk it in some warmer hot water for 30 seconds if it's really banana brushed on you and turned into a bad shape in a drawer or in a travel roll or something, you know? Those are all options to, to fix your brush. You shouldn't do it too often, but if that happens to you, you can use that to fix it. Okay, I'm trying to get this yellow just at this area right here. I think everywhere else I'm kind of happy with the, the, the white showing up. I'm going to leave that um, there. Over here I left less white um, um, showing up there. But it depends on the different roses and I might go and fill some of that up depending on the balance. So let's do a few of the leaves here. Now again, the leaves don't have to be green. Okay, They can be different colors. So I might go make them a, um, a different color, a, a sort of a yellow and orangish uh, color the way that I, I've seen Muha do but some of his roses and leaves and stuff like that. So I think I might do that, but some of them I very well might make green because remember in this ugly little thumbnail <laughs> that I was showing earlier that I was depending on those green uh, leaves to sort of marry some of this green to the rest of the piece. So I might intermittently throw in some green. So let's, let's do a little bit of both here, shall we? So I've got that in and it's nice and damp. 
and again for um, anybody who is who's been uh, worried about having the videos going private and public like I said I overhauled my channel and all of the videos have been reorganized and consolidated um, I deleted eight playlists and not the videos but playlists so it makes it easier for you to peruse you can see that in the description box now and then the other thing that I did was I ended up making a lot of my private videos public again because like I said I was waiting for that um, you know there's a, a bit of confusion that happened for a while with YouTube changing to adult channels, uh, you know, or like channels for adults versus channels for kids and, you know, the content and everything. Now that most of that is over, um, I'm no longer that worried about that stuff because, like I said, my channel's been rated as okay and that I'm not hiding anything, so I'll be um, okay with that. And I think what I want to do is add a little bit of green in as well. Now, there are leaves that sort of turn that color and are that color, like, uniformly, so I also don't want to mess with doing this um, too much green in here in case it does that but luckily the serpentine green from Daniel Smith is so low chroma that you can sort of have a cooler side and a warmer side of the leaf and it'll read probably okay so I'm gonna go ahead and soften that out by dabbing it all right and doing this all over is going to marry this entire front and foreground to each other, right? So, again, you don't, you can sort of really see the mood. I've done this for two hours at this, um, by the time I'm going to end up finishing this up in ten minutes, it'll be two hours. And you can see how much that limited color scheme, the same way that a Zorn palette would, gives us this mood, but also gives me limited choices and also helps me with all of these things not being, um, chaotic because of the amount of color choices. There, there just quite simply aren't enough color choices here to make this as chaotic as it would be if I had chosen too many colors, okay? So a lot of it is just random and knowing about the color balance in some places to make it pretty, you know? Like a little bit of red down here. Just like sometimes rose thorns have that red in them even if they're yellowish everywhere else kind of like they know that if you touch them they'll draw blood you know kind of like they know that they are thirsty for blood it's a very um, unique characteristic of the thorns on roses so if you remember any of that um, it's something that you can sort of throw into how you paint it as well and just remember to soften those edges so it looks like it's all been done wet on wet um, so this is how I'm going to finish this piece um, I'm, I think I'm happy with how much I got done I mean I got done all of what I've done so far on stream this will remain public. Um, so again, no more of those videos getting hidden and going away unless I have to edit something and then I repost it when it's edited. And in this case, it should be all right. All right, so I wanna talk about the classes real quick. Um, so before I, I head away from what I was doing, let's reiterate what we were doing here. I was doing an original painting of Florence Nightingale um, using the data diagram that she sort of, uh, was famous for called Nightingale's Rose. That's why I put roses into that. I did one earlier this year in Art Deco style and used a namesake bird, Nightingale, for it instead and did Art Deco roses in the diagram instead. And again, this diagram shows, uh, the different, uh, reasons for death during the Crimean War and she's one of the pioneers of data visualization. So I want to do a tribute piece and then I guess a second one this year because this is the 200th anniversary of that. So, um, that's why I was working on this original painting, um, and also did this one earlier this here. So this one had a different limited palette, and this one has um, yet another limited palette, but this time it's ochre, uh, Windsor red, and um, serpentine green from Daniel Smith. So it gives a very interesting color scheme that I thought was very perfect for these um, autumn roses type of look of, uh, and very somber. Not, not like I said, I didn't want this piece to be gleeful because remember she's a serious person who did serious things, but also that um, the data viz is about war and deaths. And so I didn't want it to be like candy colored, you know? So like I said, the color is dependent on your mood as well, not just um, the subject. So I've got that going. And on this weekend, um, I want to show, so just really quickly, that I have Zorn palette coming up this weekend. We're gonna be using this palette to paint this painting. So I've already done this painting with gouache, but I'm gonna be doing it again, um, brand new. Um, we're using this Zorn palette with students. You'll learn how to use a limited palette, learn how to do gouache with tiling, and that's $35. And if you want a, a really bargain class, we're gonna be doing 
this drawing class for just $15 will be the same class that's gotten rescheduled and since I'm doing it solo I can offer it at the discount price of just $15 because it's not with the Art League. So, um, and that's going to be the case for all of my own solo classes. They're going to be much more affordable at $15 or $20 and there's a direct secure PayPal and credit card link to pay for my class. Um, so it's very easy and I get the email directly. Um, and the links are on my community page. So I'm actually going to be, if you go to my uh, website, there's going to be links to how you can get to my classes, but also if you just go to my community page on my YouTube channel or my Instagram, I'll be advertising those classes there. So for um, the class this weekend, Zorn Palette Portrait doing the blue veil, except for with the Andrew Zorn Palette, and the class after this is going to be the Taniel characters, Gibson Girl, and the Renee Bull Fantasy Castle, only for $15 for three hours. And remember, for all of these classes that I ever do, you get the rewatch videos that are private for you if you signed up and you get to rewatch it forever and ever. So it's not just the live stream class that you get. It's also the rewatch videos. And I don't think very many people offer that for live stream classes or online classes. They sort of just say, you took the class or if it's in person, you definitely take the class and it's over. In this case, you get the edited rewatch video for life. Okay. And you also get email input from me on your work. So I think it's a pretty good bargain given how much um, I know um, I used to charge for university classes, you know, so this is like not even close to <laughs> anywhere that amount. So anyway, if you sign up with um, a free Gmail, YouTube or Google account, you get the live Q&A and also you get the private rewatch video for just the first 50 people. Um, and there you have to sign in to rewatch and just remember that. So you can anybody can watch it, but you can um, do the rewatch. Um, which ones are the original drawings? These I ones? assume for the drawing class. Yeah, for the drawing class, we did some original drawings the last time. This time we're going to be doing master study, so you can learn about Sir John Tenniel, who did, um, the Alice in Wonderland pictures, and we're doing some of his pictures, but we did do original drawings in one of the, some of the other classes where we did this jellyfish, which, by the way, is the other half of my jellyfish mermaid, and we did, like, these fishes and seahorses. That was for the, the drawing class that uh, has already, you know, happened. That was the, the marine creatures one. So these are all original drawings. So depending on the class you're taking, it might be original drawings and it might be a master's study. So, so for these next two, they're master's studies. It's easier to deal with the master's studies in some senses because you can do it without a copyright problem. And, you know, whether it's for me or from anybody else. And also um, you can learn about the uh, illustrator or the painter and have some history, some art history there that I can put in as a historian. So that's uh, something that you'd get as well. I um, mean, these classes is because I am a historian, I put in a lot of that um, art history. Um, just remember, if you do sign up for the classes um, with a non YouTube Gmail or Google, you'll still get to watch, but you won't be able to participate in the live comments unless you're signed in. And also, if you don't use a YouTube Gmail or Google account, you won't get the rewatch video that all uh, 50 students, the first 50 students get. But remember, you everybody still gets the email input and you get to watch live. So basically, the class is just, um, you know, the live class, the live Q&A, the private rewatch video that you get forever, and only 50 students get it for all time. So even if you want to buy it after the class is over, it's only limited to 50 based off the platform we're using. So there's no way more than 50 people can get it. So don't miss out on that. And um, so what's going to be showing up in the future is I'm going to be doing draw five ways, um, draw anything five ways um, as different series for different subjects. We've already done facial features. We did, um, you know, sea animals and marine creatures and such. And this time we're going to be doing master studies from the golden age and that's going to be happening the weekend after and again that's only for $15 and my solo classes will only be 15 and 20 if you sign up using scal if it's a class for scal like the one this weekend it's 35 if it's a solo class that I'm teaching on my own it'll be 15 or 20 so again I'm only now very recently doing some of the solo classes but um, I'm hoping that that'll be affordable to people who otherwise wouldn't be able to do the scout classes um, I think that's it for everything I'm really happy with what we've got done so far I will of course post the finished piece on Instagram and also share it with people in the class um, this weekend does anybody have any questions regarding classes or the painting or techniques or anything before I head out there's always a little bit of a delay mm-hmm but it doesn't seem like there are any questions for you. All right. Well, um, if anybody is interested, then you can always email me or leave a, a comment on the comments page as well on the community page. Okay. So I think that's a... Uh... I think that's uh, just everything I needed to share for today, but uh, thanks to everybody for joining me. This was a nice, I guess, two-hour stream. Started out as a one-hour stream, turned into a two-hour stream. Thanks for parking your brushes here with me. Uh, thanks to Elijah and Heather for moderating. And um, hopefully you'll join me on your next epic art adventure in one of my classes. Thanks so much.